It's a quiet morning just before dawn. In Temujin's camp, the family sleeps peacefully, thinking their troubles are behind them. They are very wrong. Even now, 300 Merkit soldiers thunder towards them on horseback, eager for a fight. News traveled fast on the ancient steppe, and the story of Temujin's daring escape and new alliance with Ankh Khan spread far and wide. His growing success got the attention of the Merkits, the tribe Temujin's father had kidnapped his mother from. They saw an opportunity to knock Temujin down a peg before he got too powerful. At Temujin's camp, an old woman was sleeping with her head on the ground, and suddenly she was awoken by the sound of approaching hooves. She alerted the camp. With little time to prepare for the attack, Temujin, his allies, his mother, and five-year-old child all mounted horses and took flight. But Borte was left behind. Nobody is sure if she volunteered to stay behind, as her grandmother had, or if Temujin lost track of her in the confusion, or if he left her behind in a calculated move to give them all time to escape. But in the end, it was effective. When the Merkits found Borte, they halted their pursuit and took her captive. Temujin, for his part, fled to the mountains, lying low and following the elk trails he had known since childhood. Four days later, he emerged, and seeing that the coast was clear, was overcome with gratitude for having survived. He vowed to always honor the mountains as the place of his deliverance. Temujin saw his survival as a sign that he was special in the eyes of the spirits, truly destined for greatness. But Temujin was devastated at having lost his wife. He had three options. He could return to his old camp and his pastoral life, but no matter how much he might build up and acquire for himself, there would always be the constant risk that some other enemy might come along and he would lose it all in another raid. He could head north toward the wooded, isolated lands of his childhood, but those desolate lands lacked pasture for animals. Living there would require his family to scrape by as he had in childhood, fishing and trapping and catching birds. It would be a safe life, but neither prosperous nor honorable. The third option was to follow the river south to seek the help of his patron, Ong Khan. Though Temujin had declined the offer to take a position under Ong Khan's authority a year ago, now that his newly built life was shattered, it seemed the only way to recover his bride. Ong Khan was enraged that the Merkits had acted against someone under his protection, and offered Temujin 20,000 warriors to retaliate against them. He also suggested that they enlist the help of his childhood friend and blood brother, Jamuka, who had become Khan of his own tribe by this time. Jamuka had experienced his own adversities, having been captured by the Merkits and forced into slavery just as Temujin had. But he too had escaped. He had built his own following and was now head of his own clan. He was eager for a chance to take revenge on the Merkits and to help his blood brother, providing another two cavalry divisions to Temujin's force. They sent messengers back and forth across the steppe, arranging where and when to meet. Jamuka arrived at the appointed time and place, but Temujin and Ong Khan's forces took their time, meeting up along the way before proceeding to the rendezvous. When they finally arrived, Jamuka was livid. He had 6,000 men under his command, each with two or three spare horses. The army's 15,000-odd horses alone were grazing 5,000 acres of grass per day, to say nothing of the horses of the families already living in the valley. All of his soldiers were geared up for battle, sleeping in the rough, and eating through their limited food supplies, and increasingly anxious to get back to their families. And moreover, such an enormous force of men and horses were not exactly inconspicuous. Any wandering Merkit might have seen what was going down and galloped off to warn the others. Jamuka scolded Ong Khan and Temujin, who were like, yeah, fair enough, our bad. The combined armies made their way north to the Merkit camp, but this was the beginning of a rift between Temujin and Jamuka that would only continue to grow. The Merkits lay in wait across a river. Each soldier built a float of reeds and swam across with a horse. The operation was too large to be a total surprise, but as soon as the Merkits realized what was happening, they panicked and scattered. Temujin frantically searched the camp for his wife, calling out her name. Now, Borte didn't realize that it was Temujin himself coming to rescue her. Any number of raiders or rivals might have been attacking, and she was not up for being captured again, so she was fleeing with the rest of the war prisoners. But when she heard Temujin's voice over the fray, she recognized it, and sprinted through the battle towards him. 
As she ran to his horse and snatched the reins from his hands, he almost attacked her, thinking she was an enemy. But as soon as he recognized her, he called off the attack, dismounted in the middle of battle, and embraced her. It was a resounding victory. The Merkits were scattered, both Temujin and Jamaka had their revenge, and Temujin was quickly establishing himself among the Mongols as a leader. But their joy was short-lived. It was discovered that Borte had been raped by her captors, and come back pregnant. Nine months after she had been rescued, she gave birth to a son. Temujin claimed that the boy was his, but because his paternity was never clearly established, the child would never be fully accepted as Temujin's heir. With the Merkits dealt with, Temujin and Jamaka's families combined their camps and lived together. At least for a time, the two men were inseparable, riding, hunting, eating, even camping together. They swore their friendship for the third time, now as adults, in a public ceremony with their combined followers as witnesses. Standing before a tree at the edge of a cliff, they exchanged golden sashes, key symbols of a Mongol man's identity, as well as horses that they had looted from the markets. And because of his blood brotherhood with Jemaka, Temujin enjoyed an elevated status within the tribe. For a year and a half, things seemed ideal. But time has a way of changing things. Both Temujin and Jamaka were powerful men with aspirations to unite and lead the Mongol tribes. Jamaka supported traditional Mongolian aristocracy, where Temujin believed in a meritocratic method, and as such attracted a broader range and lower class of followers. Jamaka came from a higher lineage than Temujin, and over time began to treat him less as an equal and more as a younger brother or a subordinate. Temujin had killed the last brother figure in his life who had demanded subservience, so, as you can imagine, this did not sit well, and they began to drift apart. One day, as the two men were riding together, Jamuka suggested that they split up their camps, that Temujin should take the goats and the sheep and camp by the river, while Jamuka took the horses and camped closer to the mountains. This was a power move. Horses were the wealth of the steppe. Horse breeders, such as those Jamaka had descended from, were a noble class. Horses played such an essential role in battle and steppe life that they were a status symbol. The message behind Jamaka's statement was clear. He was asserting his authority as a horse breeder, and treating Temujin as a lowly shepherd. Temujin was perplexed and returned to his family, relaying the order and asking his mother what she made of it. Borte overheard this and interrupted. She was angry at this betrayal, and didn't trust Jamaka any longer. She insisted that they break from the group and set out on their own, along with any of Jamaka's followers who wanted to join them. They fled that very evening, riding through the night to gain as much distance as possible in case anyone decided to pursue. The following dawn, something strange happened. Three brothers and their families, leading members of minor clans under Jamaka, caught up with them. Then more families from other clans caught up as well. In the end, many of Jamaka's followers chose to join Temujin. Now, they weren't the greatest of families. Jamaka still had the loyalty of the established leaders, but Temujin offered something that Jamaka could not. The prospect of advancement. At the age of 19, Temujin had taken his first great step on the road to leadership and power. The rift between Temujin and Jamaka would grow into two decades of warfare, as each young man rose in stature as leading Mongol warriors, accrued followers, and built up their bases of power. They would grow from sworn brothers to the bitterest of rivals, splitting the Mongols into a vicious civil war full of raids and killings. Their rift was not just personal, but also ideological. As the rightful heir to his position as Khan and coming from a noble lineage, Jamaka was fighting to maintain tradition and aristocracy. Temujin was a radical who cared more about the quality of his followers' character than their heredity. His following was a motley band of mixed class and origin. He had fought his way up from nothing, going from a ragged child hunting rats in the woods to a respected military leader. His following lacked the legitimacy of Jamaka's noble background, but it was very appealing for those who wanted to find freedom and build a better life for themselves. The fight for the future of the steppe tribes had begun. <laughs>